Hello, and welcome to World Canvas from International Programs at the University of Iowa. I'm Joan Kerr, and we're coming to you from Film Scene in downtown Iowa City. This is part two of a three-part series on tobacco, pot, and the public interest. I'd like to remind you that you're invited to join us for these live shows in Iowa City if you find you can. Otherwise, you can find these programs on UITV, YouTube, iTunes, and the International Programs website, which is international.uiowa.edu. You can also find pro uh, uh, information there on upcoming programs and also the archives of all of our past World Campus shows. If you'd like to learn more about Film Scene, go to icfilmscene.org. In this segment, we'll be looking at marijuana or cannabis, the properties of the drug, the potential for addiction, and changing public attitudes toward the use and regulation of marijuana in both recreational and medicinal forms. Marijuana has long been part of American culture, but it has lived underground as an illegal and presumed harmful drug. But changes in public attitudes toward marijuana in many parts of the country have resulted in legalization or at least debate about the potential for harm to the individual and society from the use of cannabis. Although there's clearly no uniform agreement on the question of legalizing the recreational use of pot, research has shown that medicinal cannabis, often called medical marijuana, may improve pain, side effects, and discomfort for certain seriously ill patients with a variety of conditions from cancer to epilepsy to PTSD, resulting in calls from many quarters to allow patients to receive medical marijuana by <coughs> prescription. This debate continues in our state and across the nation. And we'll be talking about all of this in this segment with our guests, uh, Robert Philibert at the far end, professor in the University of Iowa Department of Psychiatry. Thanks for being here, Rob. It's a pleasure to be here, Joan. Yeah. And here next to me is Frank Caligiuri, uh, professor at Drake University College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences. And thank you, Frank, for coming over from Des Moines. Thanks for having me. Oh, yeah. Appreciate it. So I think we need to start this discussion with an understanding of the makeup of marijuana or cannabis. Uh, what are its pharmacological properties, and which of those properties have led to the classification of marijuana as an illegal drug? Uh, I could throw that question to either of you. Do you want to go first, Frank? Sure. Um, I'll initiate the conversation here. So today I use the term cannabis to talk about anything related to what may be termed marijuana or pot. Um, it helps to get away sort of the 80 years of negativity associated with sort of the reaper madness move it of the past, and so I think it sheds it in a new light and is um, better to have a medical conversation using that term. So that's what I'll be using here today. And um, there are two species of the cannabis plant, but what's really important are the constituents of it or the little compounds uh, within the cannabis plant. Uh, the most well-known to everybody is THC, um, which was discovered in the 60s and is responsible for the majority of the psychoactive um, effects of the cannabis plant overall. Um, however, research has continued since the 60s, and now we've isolated about uh, over 60 different compounds known as cannabinoids from the cannabis plants. And it's those compounds that are responsible for the not only psychoactive effects that we associate with the plant, but also some of the therapeutic effects that we're seeing in current research. Um, so that's a little bit of a background on cannabis plant, and it's currently considered a Schedule I control, uh, from the Controlled Substance Act of 1970 which essentially says there's a high risk for abuse potential um, and no current accepted medical use. And so um, at this point in time, in 2015, that's where um, the biggest discussion is taking place. Is, the, is this the appropriate scheduling for uh, this plant, cannabis, in the Schedule One with no accepted medical use? So that's a little bit of a background. Yeah. And I know that you have given testimony before various committees, the Iowa legislature, mm -hmm. um, helping those members of our elected bodies understand mm -hmm. what's in this, uh, uh, what's in cannabis, and you know, um, I'll have to ask you, but I, I suspect that you are most interested in presenting what you know to be uh, the the medical and pharmacological side of, of this discussion. You're you're not particularly promoting one thing or another. No, not um, at all. Yeah. Yeah, but um, in terms of the. Everybody in this room is aware that in Iowa it is illegal to buy, smoke, sell marijuana, or uh, marijuana is the term of art on the street, sure. I guess, right? Um, but um, there has been a lot of discussion in this state and in other states about allowing um, prescription delivery of some of these, these elements mm -hmm. uh, through oils, uh, cannabis extracts, and so on. Um, what would be some of the benefits to a patient? If you could describe a, a patient, an imaginary patient out there, and some of the symptoms that person has, what might um, cannabis 
help with? That's a very, very good question because it's such a broad uh, array of things is what we're seeing from the research. I think what's really helpful um, for people to kind of look at it in a medical context is to make an analogy with something that's pretty well known to the general public, which are endorphins. Um, everybody out there in the audience, I assume, knows what endorphins are. Uh, they were named so because they're sort of our endogenous morphine, and that's where the name was derived from. And uh, the research is quite interesting because, um, you know, we discovered these compounds, morphine in the poppy plant, very similar to how we've discovered the cannabinoids within the cannabis plant. Um, and throughout history, we've isolated these compounds, morphine or heroin, were some of the first isolated from the poppy plant. And we went on to continue to follow those compounds and see where they worked in the brain and why they were so effective at stopping pain. And we found some receptors in the brain that are well known to stop pain, the mu receptors, and I'll keep it uh, relatively less scientific. Um, but after that, researchers thought, why do we have these receptors in our brain? They can't just simply be for these constituents of the poppy plant. And uh, sure enough, we found that in our bodies, we endogenously make these endorphins. So the average person realizes that if they stub their toe, these endorphins might come in to kind of help augment the pain. Or if you've been on a long run and your legs start to feel a little bit heavy or painful, those endorphins kick in. Um, so when we use drugs like narcotics or opioids, we can see the analogy. These are sort of more potent endorphins that we can't simply produce enough when we break our arm, so to speak. So we may need something like morphine that's stronger. However, what most people don't know is that research also continued in the cannabis plant, um, primarily in Israel and Italy. Um, in the 90s, uh, the same thing happened. We traced the THC in the brains and thought, where is this going and why is it doing those things? And we discovered receptors that were specific and unknown previously to this, known as the cannabinoid receptors. Uh, in fact, we discovered an entire endogenous system of receptors. Uh, there's two primarily right now and two hormones similar to endorphins that your body produces. So um, this is the endocannabinoid system, if you'd like to learn more about it. And so when it comes to the therapeutic effects, research is looking at are there dysfunctions in somebody's endocannabinoid system? Do those things change in somebody? And therefore, by supplementing um, the cannabinoids from the plant, are you working on this endogenous system to help maintain homeostasis and help their symptomology? That's uh, a little bit of a background, but I don't know that the general public appreciates that there's an endogenous system there that these compounds are acting on. I think the general public likes to think that most of the effects from cannabis come from the sedation it causes or the euphoria or those things. But in reality, there's um, pretty well defined at this point physiological and pathophysiology uh, associated with this system. So. And is it true that for medical uses generally, we wouldn't be talking about smoking uh, cannabis, we would be talking about right, some are, other kind. Right, there are different um, dosage forms available, and so they vary from everything from smoking in the typical combustion manner um, that we know produces toxic chemicals, but there are also things similar to e-cigarettes, um, like vaporization, where uh, the compounds are heated and release the active um, particles for use. And then, of course, there are things like we have approved here in the state of Iowa, which may be uh, cannabis-based oils. And then additionally, people use topical preparations as well. And those so. are allowed in Iowa. People um, can? Right now, the current law um, allows for uh, a neurologist to prescribe uh, cannabidiol oil. And there's been some issues with um, ways to acquire that oil for right. patients I here see. in the state. Yeah. Rob, what kind of um, thinking have you been doing over the years uh, about, um, we talked about addiction as a term in the prior segment, or dependence. Um, do you have experience in studying marijuana and uh, what it, the addictive uh, qualities or the, de the dependency creating qualities within this particular drug and how they might compare with alcohol or any other substance? Well, the NIH seems to fund, think so. They, they send me millions of dollars to do it. <laughs> so, the, you know, the, the, the cannabinoids, the, when you look at cannabinoids, and you look at cannabis, cannabis is, a, is like most of the other substances. There's, when you look at the behavioral classification, we like to think there are 11 basic categories of substances or uh, in substances of abuse or dependence. And cannabinoids are one of them. Um, like most forms of, I just like using the term addictions, is that the biological variability to that individual variability is about 30 to 40 percent heritable and about 70 percent due to different environmental susceptibilities. So uh, the bottom line is very complex 
Um, we are continuing to move forward in understanding the precise genetic variation that makes people vulnerable. But I want to point out, more importantly, is that the individual differences in the vulnerability of the people in this room only varies slightly. And more importantly is, is that that vulnerability is only a small portion of your total attributable risk for it. And the vast majority of the variance, whether you become dependent on cannabis or not, is actually secondary to the environment. So if you are around a lot of people who are using it all the time, you are more likely to you know, develop it? The rate of uh, cannabis dependence probably in states that uh, are very, shall we say, anti-drug like Utah mm -hmm. is markedly lower. As we talked about uh, in the prior segment, is that in the absence of the substance, there is no dependence. So there is an interaction between availability in the environment and your vulnerability. Hmm. And, and yeah. It, you know, I was just going to say um, that there's certainly when you talk about the medical um, use of cannabis, there's no denying that there is a abuse potential for cannabis. And this is where I'd like to explain the scheduling of controlled substances yeah. um, because the, the two primary classes that um, you need to be aware of as a citizen if you are engaged in this topic or conversation is Schedule 1 and Schedule 2. And what's interesting about those two schedules are they both say the same thing about abuse potential and harm. They both say substances in these categories have the highest level of abuse and the highest um, potential for harm. The only difference is that Schedule 1 says there's absolutely no medical accepted use and Schedule 2 says there is an accepted medical use. So to give you some examples, in Schedule 1, cannabis falls there, which is a little bit odd considering the fact that it is actually legal in 32 states um, to have a product like that. So it's recognized for its medicinal value on a state level, but not federally. Um, and then other controlled substances in Schedule 1 include LSD, um, psilocybin, um, heroin. But when you move into Schedule 2, it's interesting because Schedule 2 contains substances like methamphetamine and cocaine. Um, so those are Schedule II substances. And again, as you can see, nobody's debating the harm or abuse potential of those substances. We consider them all quite highly readily available for abuse. The only difference is it's just interesting that cannabis um, has not been moved to a Schedule II. That's the discussion occurring nationally at a federal level. There's been a bill introduced by um, a bipartisan committee led by senators from Oregon and California for rescheduling. The American Academy of Neurology has recently published a report in December asking for rescheduling to increase research so we can learn more about its effects in epilepsy um, and other neurologic conditions. And even the American Academy of Pediatrics um, has called for rescheduling. And again, when you say, I support rescheduling a cannabis, you are not saying anything different about its abuse potential, its harm, what you think about the youth using it. You still say that it's not that, but you're opening up the window for potential research and acknowledging that there may be some therapeutic effects for this. But I think it's all at the same time, it's, Frank, it's very important to recognize right now the same uh, academies that are calling for uh, greater research also recognize there is no systematic body of evidence that suggests that cannabis actually has clinically beneficial effects. I think more importantly is what they're recognizing is, is that in the current environment, our policies are perhaps having greater, you know, never make the cure worse than the illness, we say in medicine. And I think sometimes arresting, uh, arresting kids for making, shall we say, for experimenting, for making poor decisions is probably not the way we want to, to go in our society. Um, you know, one very good example of the, I would say, overselling of the medicinal benefits of, of marijuana has been as far as cancer. And for instance, you're quite familiar with Marinol. Mm -hmm. But it, in, in clinical trials, our current uh, chemotherapeutics that we use for controlling nausea are much superior to Marinol. And of course, in the state of Iowa, uh, we've legalized this, uh, legalized it for control of certain types of epilepsies. Yet there is no controlled trials mm -hmm. to demonstrate that is effective in epilepsy. So uh, the, the, the policy of medicine is not necessarily the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. And I think what we have to do is move carefully into this environment, do the research, and engage the public in education. Um, is marijuana the reefer madness you, you mentioned? Probably not. Is it, shall we say, is it a panacea? 
Certainly not. And I think the public has to be realized is that, you know, the, the, the keys for better living come through healthy habits. Medicine can play a role and can cannabis play a role for some individuals? It's possible. But right now, the jury is out. What would you say to a family? Um, I've been reading a few articles and blog posts from people who are pushing for um, uh, greater um, uh, availability of, uh, of um, medical cannabis. And, um, you know, so if you talk to a parent who has a child who's severely ill, who seems not to be helped as much as the parents hope the child could be helped in any number of, um, you know, symptoms that are side effects that are terrible for this child. The child's not a driver. The child is not, um, you know, hanging out with a bunch of people sharing dope. This is a kid who needs some kind of relief. And the parents say, look, maybe it won't be the answer to all of our problems, but it might help. Shouldn't it be available as, uh, you know, if so what, what do you say to somebody who says, couldn't we try it for my sick child? Well, the FDA actually has exemption programs for this. And right now at the federal level, they have chose not to, to engage in that. And I, I, you know, whether that policy should change, I think this is really, you know, this is why we have politicians to make these type of decisions. The body of the, the job of scientists and physicians is to advise such, such individuals. I'm confident with time and with patience, we'll make the right choices. Yeah, there are currently um, studies underway. In fact, um, a researcher, a neurologist here at the University of Iowa is um, enrolling patients in a, in a product known as Epidiolex, which is just one of the constituents of the cannabis plant. Um, and within a few years, we should have the data for that to really be the sort of breakthrough on whether at least CBD or cannabidiol works for epilepsy. There have been abstracts reported at recent neurology meetings and such where people are reporting their preliminary findings and I would agree that cannabis is not a panacea or a catch-all, um, but they are seeing somewhere around half the patients seeing about half their seizures cut in half, at least in these preliminary reports. So um, there's at least something to be said about the benefits, and um, that's what sort of got me involved in this as an educator, is just simply to be um, help with the education and dissemination of information uh, about the topic, as well as be a patient advocate uh, for people who may not be in the situation to understand the material that they're reading, or, or to look at the science. So that's where I come into play and what I see as my role and what I try to pass on to my students as well is, is the patient advocacy. So all we'd really like to see is that rescheduling to increase research so we can find the answers to these questions. And I think yeah. it's fair to say the same research at the university because like uh, I run a lot of large labs so we collect a lot of DNA and serum samples is also showing that the harmful effects of marijuana on developing brains. Make no mistake. Cannabis kills new neurons. Now the question is, is it the worst thing in the world? Is it worse than alcohol? Is it worse than tobacco? I think the jury is still out in many circumstances. But I think, once again, this is a policy situation. The job of scientists wants us to, is to do our studies, to advise. But you know, the question is, we will not know the answer unless we do the studies. So, you know, we've been talking about public health, and we'll have another segment about public health. Um, is this one of those cases where public initiatives, in a way, have sort of gotten ahead of the science and gotten ahead of the, the sort of uh, all the, the data that needs to be sorted and we need to come to some kind of large conclusion? If you look at the states that have now legalized the use of marijuana, and um, we don't know what will happen, what it'll look like 10 years from now, 20 years from now, who knows, but... Um, but there has been a public drive to change the attitude toward at least legalization of, of uh, marijuana. Um, how does it strike you? I mean, does this, I know this is political life in a way, but it's still, it's a controlled substance, and we have other controlled substances that, that are legal under certain kinds of regulations, alcohol, tobacco, of course. Um, you know, what do you think when you see states um, overturning uh, the, the former restrictions and allowing greater access? Um, personally, I think they're just kind of more up to speed with the current literature that's out there in all honesty. Anybody can go to PubMed and do a search at what's been done. And, in, and here in the United States, research is quite restricted because of the Schedule One access and the DEA licenses required. But however, around the world, there are other uh, countries really excessive in research. So for example, Spain is one of the leading researchers looking at um, different products. The United Kingdom has a um, pharmaceutical company who has about 
eight different formulations in the pipeline currently, and two of them being um, investigated by our current FDA. Those are known as Sativex, which is available in 24 countries, and Epidiolex. Um, not only that, we, we touched on Marinol briefly. Marinol and uh, Sesamat or Nabilone are the two drugs that are approved by the FDA, and uh, those were approved back in 1985 to help with um, nausea and vomiting associated with chemotherapy. But as uh, Dr. Philibert said, they're not very effective, and part of the reason was they were just isolated, just THC, and people couldn't handle the side effects of such a psychoactive substance. Um, some of the newer drugs that are coming to market are combinations of the constituents of the plant, which lessen the side effects. Um, and what's interesting, um, how I also got kind of plugged in when I was in, in the year 2009 was when this really kind of popped up in the state of Iowa. Um, the board of I uh, Iowa Board of Pharmacy was challenged to look at this issue of whether it belongs in Schedule One or Schedule Two in 2009. And forums were held all over the state, including here in Iowa City. And people came from all over, uh, physicians, public health officials, um, citizens to talk about it. And the Board of Pharmacy went back and gave their ruling in 2010. And they said that we believe, based on the evidence and the literature search performed by the Drug Information Center here at the University of Iowa, actually, um, that there's enough evidence at that point in time, and this is 2009, to support the rescheduling. However, they made their recommendation, and it was up to legislators to pick up the ball. I was sitting in Missouri thinking, I'm really proud of my progressive home state. I think we're doing things to help people that might be suffering. Um, so let's see what happens. And then you fast forward. I moved back in 2013 to work with Drake University. And a gentleman by the name of Steve Jennison, who is a former Iowa graduate from the University of Iowa School of Medicine, um, was here from the state of New Mexico to talk about their cannabis program and was actually the director of that program. So here's a homegrown Iowan guy coming back to tell us about his program, what worked, what didn't work. And what I found interesting about that is when people consider medical cannabis programs, the first thing that comes to mind is California, where you can get a card for anything, or Colorado, but how many people have ever heard anything about the New Mexico program? Very few people. It's a very well done, tight knit, uh, program. They have about 10,000 patients in their registry, half of which um, receive medical cannabis for PTSD, um, which is unique to that state. So um, that was sort of how I got in the loop here in the state of Iowa, plugged in with these guys who were um, advocates, and that's how I met Senator Bolcom and such. So recently in 2014, the Iowa Board of Pharmacy was challenged with this topic once again. Uh, they just made their recommendation in January of this year, and once again they moved uh, to support rescheduling to Schedule 2. And there's a current bill, um, Senate Bill 1005, that's in place this year. So you can speak to your um, senators and legislatures about that if you do support um, the rescheduling of cannabis here in the state of Iowa. I would also add the state of Connecticut is an interesting model. What most people don't realize is each state can do their own thing, is what's, what's kind of the nice thing about this. So in the state of Connecticut, they've rescheduled it as a Schedule 2 and only licensed pharmacists are allowed to own dispensaries and dispense it as a medication, um, which is unique in the first model like that. Our neighbors to the north in Minnesota have a model that doesn't allow for any smoking of cannabis, only liquid and such. So there are a lot of variables um, that people in the state of Iowa can consider uh, if we do come up with a cannabis pro program. And I, I think the, the key thing I wanted to uh, uh, put before the, the, the community here this number one is the jury is out on the merits of cannabis. And like the tobacco industry, like the alcohol industry, I think, you know, the, the key thing, it's quite clear it's not a panacea. It's also quite clear to date no drug has been shown to be effective in clinical trials. Now, does that mean that won't happen? Um, no. In fact, you know, there are a lot of drug companies working on it. And if there is something to be to, to that will come out of it, I'm sure Pfizer, Merck, will get it done. At the same time, it's important to realize in the public debate is to look at the motives of the individuals that are pushing for things. Have patience and realize change when change is beneficial does not come quickly. It comes with forethought and with I would say a little bit of reservation. So I wouldn't be running in to, to legalize marijuana. Do I think that we need to throw kids in jail for using it? Nah. nah I, I, I think that's the wrong approach. I look at it as, as, a, as a drug, like many other drugs, and that sometimes some good can come out of it.
Hmm. Wow. Uh, in the last moment we have here, you, you mentioned some of the research your lab does, and, and you are funded by, because there's an NIH and, and some of these uh, large uh, health organizations. What kind of research are you doing into? Mm -hmm. we essentially, what we have developed and, uh, and patented, actually, are technologies that allow us to quantify the type of substance you're taking, how much you've taken it, and how long you've taken it. And we're hoping that that type of approach will help us understand the environmental interactions and the, the phenomenology, the clinical phenomenology, that begins with the predilection to substance use, the initiation process, and the dependency process. And our hope is, is that by better understanding the environment and the behavior, that we can more effectively prevent, diminish escalation, and better treat forms of substance dependence. Well, thank you both. Wow. Frank Caligiuri from Drake University here, Rob Philibert from the University of Iowa. Really appreciate you both being here to educate us on this issue. Um, unfortunately, that is the end of this uh, segment of World Canvas, and we hope you can stay with us for part three in just a moment, where we'll discuss the sometimes contentious intersection between personal liberty and public interest. World Canvas programming is available on YouTube, iTunes, UITV, and the International Programs website, international.uiowa.edu. And you can find out more about Film Scene at icfilmscene.org. I'm Joan Kerr, and that's it for uh, this part of our program. Thanks very much for joining us, and good night. Thanks. Thank you.